So you guys are the diehards, and um, we're so happy um, that you're um, here. We've got an awesome uh, panel. So today we've really talked about what the requirements are for storage, um, how those requirements vary depending on where you are uh, geographically around the world. And this last panel, um, we're going to tie it all together talking about, you know, what are the technology options and how are we going to scale those um, to get to where we need to be. Um, so, uh, so just some brief uh, introductions before I invite um, our speakers up one at a time. Um, the panelists today, we have Professor Yi Shui, who is um, uh, the director um, of the Precourt Institute for Energy and newly announced faculty director, I guess inaugural faculty director of the Sustainability Accelerator um, within the new school at Stanford. Uh, we have uh, Professor Adam Brent, um, Associate Professor of Energy Science and Engineering and also Faculty Director of the Natural Gas Initiative. Uh, James Klausner, Chairman and Co-Founder of Red Blocks, so, sorry, Redox Blocks. Uh, Chris Graves, Founder and CEO uh, at Noon Energy. And last but not least, Eric Flecton, COO at MRG. Uh, so, um, I would like to go ahead and invite Ishwe up to the podium to kick us off with the first presentation. Well, thank you, Naomi. Um, you know, long duration storage has been a very important, exciting topic. Um, Prequel Institute plan to do this. Uh, a workshop for quite a while now. I want to spend the next maybe 10 minutes or so to share with you uh, just the perspective of um, using uh, metal hydrogen gas batteries. Um, so let me go, th go through the analysis I have, uh, the roughly the scale we are talking about. So based on the electricity consumption with solar and wind integration, 100% clean electricity, assuming we store the electricity for 72 hours, that's about 200 terawatt hour you are talking about. I mean, this is simple estimation. This different time scale. This will be very, this will be very complex. But this gives you an order of magnitude you are looking into. So what does this mean? This is uh, using $100 per kilowatt hour system level cost, this will give you a $20 trillion. If this needs to produce in 10 years, every 10 you need to change, right, that's $2 trillion per year. We also, in the same time, the mobile application, 1.4 billion car running on the road, if you all electrify to the level of 70, 70 kilowatt hour per car, this is another 100 trillion a terawatt hour. So about $10 trillion market. Let's add this together. You are really, really looking into the orders of magnitude. 300 terawatt hour of batteries adding together. Our yearly production of the battery right now, after 33 years of lithium ion battery ramping up, the current production, including the plant capacity, it's only one terawatt hour per year. It takes 300 years to produce this. How do you speed up this? And then this give you, can calibrate yourself. Our, our production capacity per year probably need to scale 10 to 30x very soon, very soon. And this is from battery perspective. You're going to learn about other storage mechanisms from other uh, panelists as well. So let's look at the cost. The longer the duration, then the less time you are going to use, and the lower the capital cost you will need to be. For example, to go to seasonal, very likely you need to, you got to go to $5 per kilowatt hour. I don't see any battery technology can really get there, right? So, and you got to look at other storage technology. And it's very likely we can go to week to week, maybe a few weeks in that level, battery has the, uh, you know, the cost potentially go down to $20 per kilowatt hour. I haven't seen anything yet that could uh, reasonably allow you to go below 10. 
And then the lifetime, if you use one day per cycle, right, that's you need 11,000, you do three days per cycle, that's uh, much more cycle life you need. And you need to, need it to be maintained, maintenance free in all climate conditions, very low temperature, very high temperature. Currently, you all know lithium ion require air conditioning. And your solar is probably in a very hot environment. Your wind may be very cold. You need to be very safe. Accidents keeps coming in uh, based on the battery, cradle to cradle re recyclability. And also, by the way, that 300 terawatt hour of battery require many billion tons of materials to make it. And uh, two days ago, in Alumajanda's keynote, you all heard about, we only probably have six industry we know how to generate billion ton scale of stuff, right? All in gas, uh, steel, cement, agriculture, and the water we consume. And uh, we don't know how to produce organic solvent, get to uh, you know, a billion ton, no, probably not even 100 million ton level. So this probably t is telling you long duration storage, very long time scale, get to billions of time scale. Lithium ion batteries might be out because you don't know how to produce even electrolyte to get to that level. So this got us thinking. I've been working on this for about 15 years now, working on many technologies. Let me highlight one. First of all, can we have something that have very long lifetime? It's actually not easy to do, you know, to really get a technology that can run 30 years. How do you prove that? Uh, together with my students in POSA, we brainstormed about this. Then we asked the question. We said, What's the longest life battery ever invented by human history? What's the end of chemistry? What's the cathode chemistry? Well, it turned out to be hydrogen become water. That's the negative electron of the fuel cells. Very long life, a million cycles. And the positive electron is nickel hydroxide become oxyhydroxide. We said, can we put this together to form a battery? We invented the nickel hydrogen. And then later we find out we were not the first person to do it. NASA has been using that and Hubble telescope for 30 years already, but people forgot about this chemistry. But the cost was too high. NASA used uh, platinum as catalyst, so we placed the catalyst with transition metal and produced this uh, beautiful chemistry. We, we showed that this can run in the lab at a time, 10,000 cycle. After that, you still have 95% capacity retention. And we estimate this can allow you uh, to the, get to the battery cost roughly $80 per kilowatt hour at scale, right? This can get you 30,000 cycle. But that's a really good starting point. If you can get below $100 per kilowatt hour with such a long cycle life, you are talking about per kilowatt hour storage cost is a cent or two or less. So that's very exciting to, to us. And then we say, it's still a cathode chemistry that's even cheaper. Instead of using nickel oxyhydroxide, can we use manganese? It, you will reduce the cost by 10 times in the materials level for the cathode. The lead, if you can do iron, that will be even better. So we don't know how to make the iron to work yet, but however, we'll figure out how to make manganese to work. So first time we invented manganese hydrogen gas batteries, we showed this can run really forever. Uh, very, very exciting. This chemistry can work well. And uh, uh, three years ago, I spun out a company in Novanio. They're really building the big battery cells like this, this big vessel, and uh, really showing high long cycle life and the product level. And another key feature is safety. Every time you think about hydrogen gas, you think about, oh, that's not uh, safe. Well, it turned out to be, after all the safety testing, we found out this is probably safest this battery you can, you can see in the, in the human history, right? You can do, put into fire, it never catch fire. It passed the uh, UL standard, the highest standard of safety. And you can shoot a bullet on it, nothing happened. And this now allows you to do building integrated storage, not only the whole battery farm. And then this uh, equal solution with uh, uh, potassium hydroxide in there, the freezing point is below minus 40 degrees Celsius. It will work to very low temperature. It also works so well in high temperature, plus 50, plus 60 degrees Celsius. 
it doesn't degrade the performance, particularly you know, at this high temperature. So this is very exciting now. You don't need to have air conditioning to maintain it. Now the whole thing becomes simple, and, uh, and the vendor is uh, shipping out this uh, uh, shipping container product. Uh, yet it's even better now. You probably don't even need shipping container because you don't need air conditioning. You just build uh, a roof, and then you just pile up all these battery cells in there. Uh, very little maintenance. So with that, let me summarize. Uh, the scale we need is gigantic. And uh, the dollars per kilowatt hour cost needs to be low. The longer the duration, uh, the lower the cost you will need. And uh, it looks like metal hydrogen gas is uh, very promising. I'm a person, you know, my whole life has been working on lithium iron. I'm kind of like, well, you know, lithium iron, now I need to, uh, it looks like I'm saying bad things about lithium iron, but lithium iron is great for transportation. For grid scale, uh, maybe something else is needed. You know, maybe this multiple solution, depending on the time scale storage you need, can come together. With that, I will pause right here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Adam up to the stage, who I think is going to switch gears and talk about uh, bulk chemical storage. Uh, yeah, that, that's where I'll end up, Naomi. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I think you teed up a couple of the things that I want to talk about. Um, I decided to take kind of a, a step back perspective on you know long-term storage and, and what do we think we're going to need, and then hopefully end up at, at some areas that I think are, are promising. Um, Human energy demands are clearly seasonal, and they always have been, um, right? So we need uh, material processing, food production, and storage tend to vary over time. Uh, we need heating for surviving in hospitable locations, uh, cooling, right? That's a more recent um, comfort-related thing that we do. I sometimes call this, uh, with students, I call it the northern hemisphere problem. The definition of the northern hemisphere problem is easy. It's that most people live in the northern hemisphere. Um, and most economic activity is in the northern hemisphere. And demand is therefore seasonal. If we were latitudinally spread out in a more even way, you could imagine a really simple solution where excess summer energy in the north goes to people in the south, et cetera, with um, uh, you know, essentially north-south laterals. But we don't really have that kind of uh, diversity across the planet, right? Actually, the vast majority of people and economic activity are um, in the northern hemisphere. So we're faced with these seasonal issues. What does this end up looking like? Here's a, I, I wanted to sort of get empirical. Here's a, a monthly EIA residential total end use energy. So this is power plus natural gas. Um, 1973 to 2022 inclusive for the years. Each year is normalized by the average of that year. And so you can see in, the, in December and January, we're at about 1.75, uh, 1.5 to 1.75 our average. And then in the summer, uh, modulo the small peak from uh, air conditioning there in the middle in July. Uh, we're maybe at 0.6 or so. Commercial is actually a little bit more extreme. So commercial varies. Um, that gets up to 2x or more in the winter. Uh, industrial and transport are quite even seasonally over the course of the year, as you might expect. So we got residential and commercial swing wildly over the course of the year. What do we actually do to deal with this now? I, I've started to say, and I still think this is true, this has got to be the least sexy and the least sort of um, understood part of the energy sector. The number of people who focus on underground natural gas storage and come to places like Stanford to talk about it is small, right? This is not a hot topic to be working on, but there are almost 400 active storage sites with a working capacity of almost five trillion cubic feet. Okay, so you say it again, five trillion standard cubic feet, right? It's at pressure, so the actual working volume is, is less, but you know, Five, uh, five trillion standard cubic feet, that's five quadrillion BTUs or five exajoules. That's about 5% of US primary energy use. And down here at the bottom, you can see the, the sort of working gas uh, flows. So let's examine what this looks like. This is net production in the US of uh, gas production minus exports plus imports. So this is, this is basically production net of, of exports for dry gas. You can see it's, it's month by month is actually quite even. Um, and you might expect this, right? Because you invest in a well, you're gonna kind of uh, produce it evenly. Um, if you can produce it now and sell it, all the better. You don't necessarily wanna wait. 
what does our actual consumption look like of natural gas? And this is natural gas for all sources in the United States. Uh, that's the blue line there. So you can see we've got two winter peaks here, the winter of 2020 and the winter of 2021. So that's production and net storage flow. So actually what we're looking at here is this, this uh, dome here is moved from the summer to the winter each year. Uh, 2020 to 2021, the empirical amount was about 2.1 trillion cubic feet or 2,000 BCF. Or kilowatt hours thermal, almost about 0.6 trillion or 600 billion kilowatt hours thermal. Okay, so that was empirical storage in the, United, in the United States. You see similar volumes in Europe and, and elsewhere. Okay, so you know, what the heck are we gonna do about this? Um, heat pumps are, are applicable in many locations and getting to be applicable I would say in most locations. So let's just assume all heat demand can be replaced with a heat pump. That's probably optimistic, but let's just say for residential and commercial, we can do that. Uh, with a coefficient of performance of three, that's again optimistic, because in cold temperatures, you're gonna get some degradation, but it's not terrible. My, my, my system's about that that we just installed. Uh, so a factor of three reduction on that, you're, now you're talking uh, two times 10 to the 11th, or about 200 billion kilowatt hours of electric. So that's what we're gonna work with. Um, or 220 million megawatt hours. Okay, so what the heck are we talking about here? We're talking about 16.1 billion Tesla power walls. I have a power wall, it's great. I'm an advocate, I'm actually gonna maybe expand my system. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know much. I, I'm a simple man, I don't know much, but I know that we're not um, installing 16.1 billion Tesla power walls in the United States. Um, uh, happy to take any bets on that. Um, as you mentioned, you know, the economics are, are greatly disadvantaged for these kinds of systems by this few discharge cycle situation, right? These, these aren't actively used. They're slow charge, slow discharge over the course of seasons. Um, and we've done this sort of activity over, ye over you know, centuries, but it used to be firewood. You would sort of stack up firewood in the, in the warm season and then you'd, you'd spend it down, right? That's just not the kind of operation that these kinds of systems are built for. What does look like that, you'd say hydro looks like that, and it really does. Hydro is this seasonal scale massive storage. So we're still looking at this 220 million uh, megawatt hours of electric. Uh, right here, uh, you can see uh, monthly hydro output is something like 20 million megawatt hours per month. So about 10 months of hydro output. So now we're starting talking about the right scale here. Um, uh, 10x the current flow capacity discharged over like a three month period instead of over the, over the, uh, the course of the year. Um, you'd have to shift all the flows to the winter and this really is in direct contrast to the current system. The current system really people think of hydro as an energy resource. That is true, but it's also a massive um, water management issue, flood control, agriculture, recreation, drinking water, downstream protection. Um, of cities on rivers and things like this. So we, don't, we really don't run it primarily as an energy, um, or we don't schedule it energy first, we schedule it other sources or other services first, right? So I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a little skeptical that we could shift that there. Pumped hydro maybe makes more sense, we're just gonna need to scale it. So here's a gross uh, output electricity sent out. Um, and we're probably talking like a 50 to 100x uh, scale up. Again, if we're, we, we, you know, we're, we're trying to talk about, uh, you, I think with you know, long duration storage the, or this seasonal kind of effect, you just have to keep coming back to five trillion cubic feet, five trillion cubic feet, five trillion cubic feet. It's literally landscape scale. So pumped hydro makes sense in the sense that like, you can imagine creating reservoirs at this kind of landscape scale. Water, uh, you know, I think there's some issues with the energy density of water. Uh, but you know, that said, this is you know, maybe making sense, but we'd have to scale it up a lot. I actually think that, that prior um, uh, estimate may be underestimating the scale of the problem. That delta, that old yellow wedge, was relative to a, flat, a seasonally flat baseline. So natural gas uh, is coming out of the ground at an even rate, and then we have a seasonal demand. If we overlay and say, I'm gonna produce the same amount of energy, but now I have this light uh, red bar there, which is, I'm gonna take the seasonal variability in solar output that we see in, for example, California, and essentially modulate the natural gas output monthly. What we're actually likely to be doing is coupling a demand system where demand is winter heavy to a solar rich energy system where output is, is, uh, is winter weak or where output is summer heavy. So the delta actually I think may be larger and in this case it just comes to be about 2x, right? Um, you could argue about wind versus solar. My assessment of the situation is that, is that solar is, um, 
growing increasingly important. Uh, the magnitude of the resource is at least 100x accessible resource. The cost curves are bending faster. Uh, it's less obtrusive. You know, there's lots of, lots of advantages of solar. So I think a solar, a solar rich future makes a lot of sense. So maybe our sort of yellow wedge we need to fill in is actually a little bit bigger than we're talking about. So we're not at, you know, 16 billion power walls. We're at 30 billion power walls. Okay, so what the heck are we gonna do? An obvious thing is to overbuild renewables. This is clearly gonna happen. We're already gonna do this for redundancy at smaller timescales anyway. And, and so, you know, we can do this, right? So we can build extra capacity so that in winter months you get more output. And then you just kind of eat the, eat the loss in the summer. You say, well, I'm just gonna curtail it. I don't really need those summer kilowatt hours. Totally doable, we are definitely gonna do this. You gotta be really careful about the LCOE calculations, right? Because uh, buried in a, in a LCOE calculation, is essentially a usage factor, right? So if you're building solar and you're only gonna use it, only, you only really need the, the electrons that are coming out in November, December, and January, because that's when you're short, this really degrades your economics, right? And so in our simulations that we've run, we make very cheap renewables. It still wants to build storage, right? Because basically building those last units uh, become brutally expensive, right? Because they're not, they're not used very much. Um, so I think this is gonna be done. The more of this we do, one thing to note, the more of this we do, the bigger that hump between the solar uh, dome and the monthly solar dome and then the sort of monthly demand curve becomes, the bigger the excess comes in the, becomes in the middle of the year. That actually increases the weight, the arbitrage weight on somebody trying to do long-term, or the arbitrage benefit of somebody trying to do long-term storage. Because you're essentially loading huge amounts of essentially free electrons onto the system in the summer that a long duration storage system is gonna be increasingly incentivized to grab, right? I think there's gotta be some kind of chemical storage. I just really don't see how we can do this without something that looks like chemical storage. Yee, I, would, I, I don't know if your system is, is closed loop or not, and, and if you would consider that a chemical storage or a battery storage, um, but I really think it's, 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 I have a hard time imagining we can't do this without chemicals. They're easy to move, we can pump liquids and gases, we can compress things. If you think about these 400 storage sites with basically landscape scale extent, right? They cover huge acreages. We're storing five trillion cubic feet of gas, right? If you can imagine creating synthetic chemicals and injecting them, I think this makes a lot of sense. The energy density of chemicals is wonderful, um, much better than you know hydro elevated uh, gravitational potential energy, etc. I don't think we need to be like super sophisticated about this. I don't think we need like incredibly selective catalysts where we're making pure ethane or pure some bespoke molecule. I think if we get a mix of reduced chemicals, um, as long as they don't condense underground, I think this, you know, I think we could have kind of a mix of things. It, it could be a syngas with hydrogen and synthetic methane and, and sort of, we don't need, it needs to be cheap. It doesn't necessarily need to be the most uh, pure stream, right? It's not a chemical process, it's a, um, you know, we're generating energy, so we can burn a fuel mixture, right, that we generate. There is costs associated with conversion, but I think even at modest levels of over, overbuild, which we're gonna get, because we already kind of have them, we're gonna have a lot of low cost electrons. So I think the idea that we need to have some terribly efficient chemical conversion mechanism is not right. I think it needs to be cheap, um, but I think we're gonna actually have, you know, it's that cheap, you know, efficient is nice to have, but, but cheap is more important, because we're gonna have an excess of summer electrons. We already do in California, and it's coming, coming to the rest of the world very quickly. Uh, thermal storage, I, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, um, you know, it's not a hot thing. Oh, I'm out of time here. Okay, so, uh, you know, thermal storage, is, this is not like a hot topic. But if you think about it, you know, oh, uh, some of you say, well, um, long-term storage, it needs to be dirt cheap. Well, what's cheaper than dirt? We got dirt, right? So maybe if, if storage needs to be dirt cheap, we should actually use dirt. Um, so we've got earth under our feet. That's a thermal storage medium, right? And so there are geothermal heat pumps that have accessed this. I think the cost and reliability have not been there to date. And so, but if we could reduce the cost, you could imagine this very long-term gentle storage where in the summer you're extracting excess heat out of your house, putting it underground, warming the earth. You have this giant thermal battery under you, right? Our cities could get very warm underneath them. Uh, and then you slowly draw that down over the winter, right? And so I think this, you know, I, I don't know, I think there needs to be more work on it. I know there's startups working in this area, but maybe there needs to be more attention here for this kind of gentle, uh, long-term, dirt-cheap sort of storage, um, you know, of interest. So that's it, those are my thoughts. Sorry for, I ran over a little bit there. Uh, <clears throat>
Uh, James Klausner is up next to talk about thermal uh, storage. Where are you, James? Oh, there you are. I thought you'd disappeared on us. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm James Klausner, and I come from a company, Redox Blocks, which is a startup company that came out of my laboratories from University of Florida and Michigan State University. We moved our headquarters to San Diego, and we also have uh, business offices in um, Dornburn, Austria, going after the European market. And we also have some facilities in Bend, Oregon. And our last speaker, Adam, to quote unquote, said, thermal storage is not a hot topic. No pun intended, right? Well, let's see if I can make it a hot topic. <laughs> so um, what does redox blocks do? Um, we're looking towards decarbonization and using our thermochemical energy storage technology for global decarbonization. And we take a systems level approach and look at various opportunities where thermochemical storage can fit in and decarbonize um, various entities. So there's basically two business sectors we're going after. One is industrial heat and provide a zero carbon industrial heat solution. And the other is grid scale electricity storage. And this uh, workshop has been mostly focused on um, grid scale storage in the grid. Um, our early entry market for sure is industrial heat just because we can get into that market at a much smaller scale. We look at grid scale storage, you gotta be a much larger scale to be relevant and that's a longer term market. So we have different strategies for those different sectors. But essentially, the value proposition that we bring is we can be a drop-in replacement for natural gas combustion. And the advantage that brings is if you put in electrification and storage, you, can, you do not have to pay the capital cost of a new piece of equipment. You can just retrofit it with electrification and storage, and you save that capital cost on an electrified piece of equipment. And how can we do that? We deliver high temperature gas at 1500 Celsius, which is about the same at temperature as combustion gas, and so we can be a direct um, retrofit. And then we provide the advantage of storage is we can grab electricity while it's being curtailed, store it, and um, deliver it as high temperature heat for various applications. So what is thermochemical storage? Um, most people haven't heard of um, this type of storage, but essentially we're taking renewable electrons from the grid. We dissipate those electrons into high temperature heat, and that heat is around 1500 Celsius. And we drive a chemical reaction. Um, it's a manganese-based solid state compound that's in a spinel phase. And when we heat it up to 1500 Celsius, it goes in the forward reaction that's shown, which is highly endothermic. And it releases oxygen, so we get oxygen out, pure oxygen out as a byproduct, and it goes into a chemically reduced state. And in the configuration that we're developing, we basically have a packed bed of material. The pelletized material that goes in the packed bed is shown on the lower right-hand corner. And again, as Adam said, you need a dirt sheet material. And these are basically materials that we dig out of the ground. And so we can produce these pellets at about $600 per ton. Um, because we're storing energy chemically, we have a very high energy density, 2,400 megajoules per meter cubed, which is the same energy density as lithium ion, although we're delivering heat, not electricity. So we want to recover that heat. All we need to do is bring air and blow air through our bed of pellets that are in a reduced state. The oxygen in the air reacts with the pellets 
releases that heat. It's a highly exothermic reaction in the reverse direction and re releases high temperature heat at 1500 C. And so you have oxygen depleted air now at 1500 C you can send in to in replace of combustion gas and whatever equipment you want to electrify and store energy. And so obviously high temperature industrial processing is one application. Another application is just um, retrofit a combustion turbine um, with high temperature heat, drive that turbine and put electricity um, back onto the grid. So we re um, look at this as reversible combustion. A lot of the innovation is in that material um, because it's very difficult to find a material that can reversibly uh, go through oxidation reduction reactions, so that's redox blocks, by the way, um, uh, for many cycles. So one configuration that we have is essentially the system is extremely simple. You have a steel shell for containment. You have um, refractory insulation lining the interior. We have refractory brick surrounding the packed bed of materials. Um, at high temperature, our material is electrically conductive. So when you want to charge the system, you have electrodes at either end of the bed. You bring electricity, charge the system. It acts like a giant resistor, heats up. We suck out oxygen, put it in a reduced state. We want to get heat back. We just have an air pump, pump air through the system, and we get heat back. Very simple system. It does a lot of things in a very compact um, and simple way. Likewise, um, we can have a similar type of configuration, except with an air pump, we just put in a combustion turbine. And um, we use that combustion turbine, the compressor, to push air through the system and expand hot oxygen-reduced, um, oxygen-depleted air through the combustion turbine to put electricity back on the grid. So if we combine this system with a combined cycle plant, we can get about 55% round trip efficiency. On the industrial heat side, going from electricity to heat's about 95% um, round trip efficiency. So one um, really grand proposition is to take existing assets, such as a combined cycle plant, that you might otherwise shut down, or you might just have it um, sitting idle for most of the year and just bring it online for resiliency. Or you can convert that asset that already exists into an energy storage plant by retrofitting with thermochemical energy storage. Um, you can replace combustion with the um, high temperature oxygen depleted air coming out of the storage system and run that system to get extra capacity factor out of it. The other thing you could do, you could run it in a hybrid mode. If you don't have renewables available, you can still burn gas through the turbine and put energy on the grid for resiliency, for grid resiliency. The other nice thing is it's a inertial asset um, which has benefits for grid stability. So if we compare um, just the metrics of this technology versus molten salt. Um, we have about three times the energy density of molten salt. The material cost is about a quarter. It, high temperature is more than double, and we have a very fast charge rate, and the charge rate is very important. Um, to the left is a 100 kilowatt pilot we have going on in Bend, Oregon right now. Um, upper right is the project we have in planning with a California utility at a two gigawatt hour scale, and this shows you scale. Lower right is an industrial heat application for a foundry melt furnace and decarbonizing um, um, metals casting in foundry industry. Just real simple economics on energy storage. If I define R as the difference between my spread, where my spread is the selling price minus the purchase price, and R is S minus operating costs, the number of cycles for payback is simply the capital cost of storage divided by um, R, um, which is the revenue I can generate per cycle. 
Uh, my profit is basically my capacity times R times number of cycles uh, minus my initial investment. So what does that tell us? We need a low capital cost to make storage, um, give a business case around storage. We need a large spread. We need as many cycles as possible. And we need a large storage capacity. So we want to cycle as much as we possibly can. So daily storage is a lot easier to make a business. It is still tough to make a business case than um, seasonal storage. Um, you want to be able to have a large spread between um, what you're getting your electricity for and um, what you're selling it for. And therefore, you need to be able to charge very quickly. Um, let me just say who we are. Uh, many of you um, in the Bay Area know Dane Boyson, um, who I recruited to be CEO of Redux Blocks. I'm a co-founder. Scott McNally, actually, um, is a graduate from Stanford as our VP for business development. And we're a company in growth. We have a number of projects in the pipeline right now looking at deploying thermochemical energy storage. And we couldn't do it without our partners. We're a small group, but we have great partners to work with. And um, hopefully, we can start making a difference in um, deploying and growing this technology. Thank you very much. Our last talk is Eric Flechten, uh, COO at Emergy. And Eric's going to be talking to us about hydro. All right, so it's uh, user friendly. Well, congratulations, you've made it to the last speaker on the last day. Um, <clears throat> I'll try not to take too much time. Um, the, so Emergy, who are we? I'm, so I'm here to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to share a lesson that I learn every day from our founder, who actually I'm standing in for today, Emily Morris. Um, if, if you know the book Traction, we got together because she's the visionary and I'm the integrator. So, uh, excuse me. So I'm the one trying to make the vision happen, but she's the one that reminds me every day not to let facts stand in the way of where we're going. And when we look at what challenges are in front of us related to long-term storage, my goodness, um, it's easy, easy to get paralyzed. If you're like me, I, ha I look to folks uh, like our, our CEO and co-founder, I look to folks like many of you in this room to inspire me for what we can do to solve these problems. What Emergy is, we're the crowdsourcing part of this. <laughs> we're a very small fraction of what, of what the solution is, but there's an army of companies of, uh, like us out here or out there um, that are hitting all these little, little pieces of the puzzle, trying to solve what the bigger problem is, and we're all working together to do it. So I loved hearing the last two presentations for sure, where the, where the rubber meets the road, and some of those that I've talked to you today. Um, love hearing the ideas, and you know, just keep, keep on it. So Emergy, what are we doing? We are providing distributed hydropower. Um, we're looking at how to utilize existing infrastructure to provide distributed hydropower, and I'll tie this into storage here at the end. So, there's uh, existing water infrastructure all over the world. There's riverine structure, there's hydropower dams, there's irrigation systems, there's municipalities. Um, you have this water that's just flowing downhill, and it's energy. Um, if you talk to any of the folks that operate these systems, it's their dream to be able to pull the energy out of it and put it back um, into the grid, or put it into their pumps to pump groundwater, or put it into their pumps to redistribute somewhere else. So that's what we're doing. It's a, we're taking a known technology. We're leveraging all of the hard work that many others have done in order to make this what we believe finally economical. Um, and so as a company, we recently finished our Series A. We got a good amount of funding, have some great investors behind us. We have a great slew of customers that believe in what we're doing in these irrigation districts. And we're doing everything we can to take advantage of these existing, uh, um, existing resources. So you can see in the, in the photo there, they're like SUV-sized uh, vertical access turbines is the core technology. Uh, there's a typo there, that's 20 to 50 solar panels each, not 200 to 500. These, are, these turbines are generally 5 kilowatts to 25 kilowatts, if you're wondering about the size of an individual turbine. 
when you look at it globally, there's millions of miles of engineered canals. Um, we're also working on an RPE grant right now in order to get this into the riverine environment. But when you look at engineering can, engineered canals, you have control of the water flow. Um, you have zero, almost zero, environmental impact issues. And the size of our systems um, can move very quickly because they don't, they're exempted from FERC licensing. So we're looking at this global market. Um, we're focusing in the Western US and a few international um, uh, targets initially, but this is, this is the market that we're looking at. So for app uh, applicable sites, um, you know, irrigation waterways, um, farmers, they're really interested in what we're doing. Um, in uh, above and below dams, um, whether it's run of the river with a long pen, um, uh, open, open channel as a penstock, um, um, or it is uh, just the feed-in channels or the, t the head races and tail races of dams. Um, some of these, uh, like working with the site in Laos, um, they have uh, you know, 20, 20 megawatt site, they have 800 kilowatts of parasitic load, and we can address all their parasitic load with these turbines up front. So this is, has real economic impact on a, on a pretty broad array of, of opportunities. Um, from the, the benefits, um, clearly it's, it is all existing assets. So the infrastructure is, is minimal. Um, the, the owners and the users, obviously they're getting the, the revenue from the, the generation. Um, and in the case of um, uh, dams that I was talking about, that lost potential, uh, they're capturing basically every, every bit that they can get out of it. Um, let me go to the next slide here. So it doesn't, there's a lot of smart people in this room. This is not complex technology. There's nuance in what we've done in terms of this vertical access turbine to make it more efficient. And there's a ton of nuance in how we are controlling the turbine to make it more, um, more efficient. You essentially, the turbine is driven by velocity and water depth. Um, those are the, that, that's, what, that's what makes us work. And the, uh, you know, the, the power output is um, the, uh, the cube of the velocity. So we, the faster the water goes, the, the better. But uh, we can still only get about 80% of the potential energy that's in that, of the kinetic energy that's in that water, we can get that out. Um, um, uh, into our generation, and then there's some fraction of that uh, that we lose and losses to get it to the to, uh, get it to the wire. So we're about 50% of what's in in the water that we can get out of it. Um, but it's the simplicity which is what drives our technology. Um, this is a it's a concrete flume. Um, its own ballast is what keeps it in the in the channel itself, um, and uh, it's a cantilevered. Uh, cantilever turbine, and then on shore we have um, our controller, and we use right now we're actually just using PV uh, inverters. So all that PE inverter development that's gone on over the years, we're just tying that to the uh, the output of our uh, power conditioning unit and our controller. So that's the the simplicity part of our technology. What we're doing for these um, water managers is we're giving them two options. Uh, one is to own it, that's the option two here, um, but they don't have a whole lot of funds in order to spend on energy. And they, they know water, they don't know energy. So what we're doing as a company and what's driving our business is that we are actually giving them the opportunity to just basically rent us um, their, their channels, to put our turbines into their waterways um, and pay them a fee um, and possibly sell them back the power at a discount from their uh, um, existing rates. Or in some cases, they don't buy the power at all. We just sell the power and they get a fee for, us, uh, for letting us use the water. So these infrastructure, um, um, uh, water infrastructure owners now have this incentive to operate their their water infrastructure in a way that um, uh, provides them some economic incentive. And that's how we get to this point of um, uh, where, where we impact storage in the, the, the regional storage um, um, dilemma, I should say. So these are some of the advantages that we bring. Um, again, no construction. Uh, we generate a new revenue that they otherwise wouldn't have. This, this uh, point about giving them a more intelligent system. 
we are now putting things into their water and knowing more about the water than they currently know and understand. So we're giving them tools to better get water where it needs to be and deliver it to their own customers, not only to produce energy, but this also helps them in how they produce or how they meet the needs of their own, their own customers um, and their water supply needs. Um, these are just some of the key things that we, that has making our technology um, cost effective today so that it actually produces a um, uh, value to uh, um, us, to investors, and also to those that are buying the power. So th these are kind of the key points that, that lead to this final, or the keynotes that lead to this final point of resulting, our systems can result in hourly, daily, or potentially even weekly um, uh, energy storage, shifts in energy delivery. Um, we are now giving the owners and operators an economic incentive that they didn't have before. We're giving them um, additional revenue, and so they have flexibility through their own systems um, through the impoundments that, that already exist for when they're going to hold water, when they're going to release water, how much water they're going to release at any given time, and how that relates to the economics of the power and the revenue that they can, uh, revenue they, they can receive from the power they produce. Um, in terms of what we're doing and, and uh, some of the advantages um, or some of the things that are making this possible for us as a company, is the knowledge and understanding of the water system infrastructure around the world. This isn't something that um, folks are cataloging, but yet now this is what we're doing. We're becoming the experts in uh, under, having the greatest understanding of what, uh, what and where water is on a regional, regional level. And so we're using that, working with, working with um, power needs and water district um, uh, water delivery needs. It looks like I need to I need to hurry up here in order to um, uh, help provide power on a on a regional, very very localized level, um, but uh, regionally and even globally. So this is where we are today. Happy to say, actually today we got a, a, a an award from an El Green Power. Um, we're working um, in projects in Denver and California, uh, Utah area. Um, Utah, yeah, sorry, Utah, Nevada, and uh, New Zealand. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll get quiet and we can, I guess, invite everybody back up here and have uh, a Q&A. All right, we covered a lot of ground, but I don't think that we covered all of the technologies out there. So, you know, it's, it's amazing all the work that's going on in this space. Um, so we have about half an hour. Um, I'll maybe ask couple of questions to get things kicked off, but um, you know, this is your opportunity to uh, dig in and ask your questions too, so uh, please uh, start thinking about those. Okay, um, E, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, um, you know, something that you said right at the beginning, you know, you really laid out what an enormous challenge this is. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing, right? Um, and the need to not just develop technologies that uh, can meet the terawatt magnitude, but also the need to do that really quickly. And um, you know, you've you've had a lot of experience both on developing the technologies and bringing them to market. So, you know. How are we going to do this? And and what do you see as the main sort of um, market and regulatory factors that are impacting scale up. If I use the, uh, I think this is probably highly sector dependent. Uh, what technology you are thinking about? Uh, if I look at the the, the battery domain, uh, I think the current policy is highly supported. The investment going in is gigantic. Uh, now there's one thing ahead of us that the challenge is actually geopolitics. Uh, that indeed make it, uh, you can say, probably attractive for, for us domestically because IRA. But in the same time, it also make it challenging if you source internationally uh, the supply chain, 
uh, want to reduce the cost. I think that's one type of risk we have been facing right now. I think each company, probably not just the battery, but also others, needs to really generate the international strategies. You need to look into how if you import something, you know, you have the tariff. If you, you couldn't get IRA coming in, what's the cost you get internationally versus produced locally? You need to go into that very careful uh, calculation in order to uh, survive. And the second thing is, I think the mining industry, is, the pressure is building up. We're looking at lithium, right? Lithium supplies going up, now come back down, and then at some point it's going to go up again. Uh, uh, nickel uh, as well. Nickel is not distributed uniformly. So each of these from global supply chain consideration, uh, there's certain uh, policy regulation you, you will need to consider. Uh, yeah. I'll just pause right there. Other other comments on market regulatory factors that are impacting, you know, getting this to scale. From the other panelists. Well, I'd say from a making a business case point of view, um, storage is very challenging. Mm -hmm. A business case can be made. Um, it becomes a whole lot easier in countries where there's a carbon tax that business case is, is a much easier case to be made. Um, we don't have that here, and so um, you'll see a lot less penetration and enthusiasm for stores unless the business case can be made. Yeah, was the IRA, you know, kind of helpful enough? Do, what, what do we need, come on. Well, certainly the um, subsidy for storage um, is really important and that helps a lot. Um, but right now we can't say what that is because the rules um, from the Treasury Department haven't come out yet. So we don't really know what the rules are. Now we're all waiting on those clarifications. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I only can add in something of here. Course. This is uh, what I learned uh, through uh, Empress, uh, uh, the my first startup company, the CEO, the, the team's experience now Pretty soon, I'm going to learn from Innovanus experience as well. Building a manufacturing plant, I don't know what's your guys' experience. Um, the regulatory requirement can slow this down tremendously. You can have the best schedule, say, I'm going to get this up and running in about a year. Maybe in reality, this can be two to three years. Uh, for new technology coming up, you are really uh, living on that uh, three, six months of uh, cash, right? So a company probably, I don't know, you do have a year cash in your company you can run for so long. And this delay will probably impact this huge risk right there. And how do you get into the environmental approval and then get into local communities, you know, signing up, need to approve. Your, your case to build manufacturing plan. So each step adding together will probably slow down the whole thing tremendously. This needs to be considered. When we talk about scale, talk about speed, and speed is also important. Without the speed, your desire to go to, go to scale fast actually will be kill you even faster because you want to go to scale fast with, without the speed. No, for sure. When, when you're looking at scaling and you're, you're tied to predicting what, the, what some of these regulations and things that are preventing you or maybe, maybe incentivizing you, the IRA is incentivizing us and some of, the, some of the definition is not yet, there yet, but when you're looking out five years from now, 10 years from now, the, I think uh, Dr. Chu was saying this morning, the political opposition, um, the political arguments of this, of where it's going to be, make it that much harder. So if there can regardless of which maybe direction the winds are going, to understand what you need to plan for mm -hmm. is a key part of making business decisions to spend money. How fast are we going to scale? How confident are we going to be that something's not going to change next year? So yeah. that lack of consistency is difficult to manage. Yeah. Um, changing gears a little bit, you know, um, Adam, we talk a lot about 
the use of gas for seasonal storage and, and various other chemicals. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your view of how the gas and electricity systems are today and what would need to happen in terms of, I guess, integration in order for them to um, kind of really operate in a mode where we're able to leverage the gas for seasonal storage? Yeah, um, so it's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think we've got half of the piece very clearly right now in that we've got huge amounts of infrastructure that can take stored gas and we can store, you know, like I said, cubic kilometers, trillions of cubic feet of gas. And then we can take that very flexibly, very rapidly with very great responsiveness to the power side. That's obvious. We've got combined cycle gas turbines. We've got simple cycle open or open cycle turbines. We've got, so we, we have, well, you know, everything we need on the gas to power side. Um, you know, as power becomes primary, in uses electrify, um, and you know, homes, businesses, commercial industry switches to electrons, which is happening rapidly. Um, you know, I, I think we're essentially going to need that other, the flip side of that, right? If we're going to make use of the gas infrastructure, and so. Um, you know, I, I don't know where we're at on that. I know a lot of people at Stanford are working on this. I think there's probably sort of a suite of opinions on that. I guess I would say that, that you know, to reemphasize what I said before, I feel like a coupling where, um, you know, as long as it's reason, the capital cost is reasonable, it's not clear to me that we need something like tremendously selective. It's not clear that we need something that's, you know, creating, you know, 99.9% .9 pure ethane that air gas is gonna, or air products or someone is gonna sell you in a cylinder mm -hmm. as a reagent grade product, right? I think we can go, um, you know, kind of simpler than that. Um, and I, I think, you know, so I think we're gonna need that. And, the, and, and something that, you know, that Chris said, I think makes a, makes a lot of sense. I think with the gas system, the gas storage system plus gas turbines, if you think about that, it's a massive system where we have greatly decoupled the energy side from the power side. And that's a really important feature of like Chris's technology where you can essentially containerize or flow battery-like technologies in general. You can kind of, um, you know, you, you can decouple that, right? And that's one of the issues with the lithium ion batteries. If you have these very different durations, uh, Tesla needs a very different duration from a, from a home storage sort of system, right? You need to have a very different energy to power ratio. And so I think essentially what this massive um, you know, four trillion cubic feet of gas currently gives us is this huge energy resource that then we can bleed out through gas turbines or other uses over over time. And so um, we're going to need something that looks like that, and that's kind of why making use of that chemical infrastructure we've got makes a lot of sense. I don't know what the molecule is going to be. I don't know if it should be hydrogen. Should it be? Should we make synthetic ethane? I don't know you what the what the right molecule is. I think natural gas parts the CCUS is so well. We got to come Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the other option. You. So that's yeah. that's the other option. Try. Is, is to say, for the time being, yeah. forget storage. Earth is already storing the molecules for us. Pull them out, burn them, and stick stick the CO two back underground. So that's the other that's the other piece. I I, I got to say you though the like I've I've been going to CCS or CCS adjacent conferences for a long time. I'm fairly skeptical that, like, I, I don't know, I just worry about the politics of CCS, at least in the United States or places like California. I just, yeah. I just I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath waiting for that to, <laughs> for that to happen. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change gears a little bit. Chris, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, the sustainability issues kind of a, a holistic level, and you've obviously you know, come out of the electrolyzer world or the pure electrolyzer world and, and you're thinking about this too. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of sort of thinking about the materials that we're using? Because we're talking about systems that we're going to have to scale up. Um, and, you know, I, I saw you had your materials kind of what you're using. It's like steel, right? It's just cheap steel. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the benefits um, of that? I'm sure you've thought about it a lot with regard to electrolyzers and this, maybe you can sort of cover that space and, and share some of that. Yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, exactly like you said, we come from that electrolyzer world and this is sort of a, like a packaged up 
the battery is sort of like a packaged up electro electrolysis fuel cell type of a system. Um, but the advantages there are that we, uh, the resource constraints are, are not something that we have to deal with in, in that same way, right? I don't, I'm not an expert on the specifics of the lithium nickel cobalt you know, evolution, but I know there are limitations there. Um, if you go down this road, uh, at least for the bulk storage, then there's certainly no, no resource constraint. You know, um, steel and CO2, of course, uh, very abundant. Um, I really like your um, uh, Adam's uh, analogy about the natural gas storage being, um, or natural gas caverns being storage, right? And and nature kind of uh, stored that away for us for eons, and now we're just gradually using it up. So uh, we need to do this in real time, right? So we're just kind of trying to do the same thing, but not. Um, Obviously, not 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 made eons ago. We have to do it right 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 away. So, yeah. yeah. But um, also, just to say, nothing against lithium ion and nickel hydrogen and all that um, for a short duration. I don't think it's going to be a single thing. I, I think it actually might be two things. Um, but the short duration would uh, be providing a, a small fraction of the energy capacity of the system, maybe five percent or something. But actually, be able to uh, a lot do of power. To, to do the bulk of the power yeah. capacity exactly yeah. because it's very cheaper course. Yeah, some of these new batteries are very high C rate, and you can, yeah. you can do the peak power transients and stuff like that. So some complementarity there for sure. Yeah. yeah, so we're not in competition with each other, right? We're all going to be important. My guess is there's going to be th probably three classes. Would you say two or three classes? Like a medium, a very fast response, a, a short, and a, or a fast response, medium response, and like a long, long-term weeks to, I don't know, that, that would be my guess. Yeah. Um, just a couple more questions before we get to the audience one. So, James, you know, yesterday I moderated a panel on um, uh, heavy industry decarbonization. Can you talk a little bit about why heavy industry would go through this kind of pathway rather than just electrifying directly? Sure. So. Um Anyway, our customers are not benevolent. Um, they want a business case, and you have to make a business case. So, um, you know, from what the way we're doing it using storage, you can grab curtailed energy that's low cost as long as you can charge very quickly um, and then deliver energy um, that can compete. Um, with whatever other solutions there are. And so that provides, that provides a business case. Um, I think from a global perspective, the trending thought is that we're going to decarbonize industry by electrifying, electrify, electrify, electrify everything. Um, my experience getting my hands dirty and going onto customer sites is that the electrical infrastructure if they're using gas, they don't have the electrical infrastructure to electrify to the um, power and capacity levels that we need to go to. And so I think the grid is not ready for all of industry to electrify at this point. Um, and in addition, when you're building your economic case, you have to factor in that you have to buy a transformer um, that's going to be on the order of a million dollars or so to transition from a gas to electrified solution. Right. All right, questions from the audience? Raise your hand and we'll come over with a microphone. David with Murata Electronics. Uh, you guys have laid out the problem. It's very large. We need to move very fast. At the same time, you're laying out a roadmap that's going to take some time. So how do we accelerate some of these technologies faster so that we don't have to do more in the future. Feel free to jump in and answer that easy question. Yi. I'll share with you my experience. You need to know the end first. What does it take to get to the end? Uh, the scaling problem right there, this every detail component you need to put in, for example, cost reduction. You might neglect at the beginning, but you're going to find out later it's going to come back to buy to very fast, as simple as a carry gas uh, of uh, decomposition something. Instead of using argon, can you use nitrogen? That made your cost difference tremendously. But this can change things. So you need to design your final product, the processing. 
restart in mind and come back to do your R&D. Having that input very early on, because every component at, at the end matters. If we look at all the technology right here, I, I've been listening and I say, wow, you know, I can think of, of uh, a number of questions I want to ask. Well, have you considered this? Have you considered that? This eventually all contribute to your cause. Work on those very early on. Otherwise, this will come back to, uh, to hit you. Yeah, I, I would also add that we have to be doing a lot of projects. In the, every project we do, there's a learning curve, and we learn more and allows us to scale and, and get bigger. And I think the investment from Department of Energy through IRA has been very beneficial in bringing customers to the table that would not otherwise have come to the table. Yeah. And I think that's very important. And once they come to the table, they can see what the possibilities are, and they're willing to go forward with projects with or without government funding. But um, to get them to the table, that's been, that's been really crucial. Hi, uh, Jenny Milne, Precourt Institute for Energy. So I have more uh, curiosity questions here, and I'll try and just ask one. This one's for Eric. Um, does that technology affect the flow rates at all of the places that you're putting these to take out this kinetic energy? And also, have you done any um, big systems analysis to look at other factors that might affect the flow rates like droughts and done that over a, over a period of time, uh, looking out into the future, uh, thinking about what the trends might be and what that would look like in terms of the energy you can get from this? Uh, the easy answer on the first one is uh, yes, it does change velocity for sure. Um, it doesn't, although it's hydrokinetic and it does, so it's not a head-based system, it does cause some water level rise, so there actually is a drop through the turbine as it goes, as it goes through and it backs up and slows down in front and speeds up. So you have to put enough space between them to get the velocity back in order to put another turbine in. So you can't just back these up against one another. So there's a limit to the array size. Um, some canals, you know, the width is only one turbine. Other canals, you can have eight turbines across. So these arrays can be tens of kilowatts to, you know, small digit megawatts um, is the size of there. We're also looking, um, in order to, to, to maximize the benefit to these systems, we're looking in some cases where we will line canals, prevent water lost um, back in the seepage, but that speeds up the water um, and we can create more energy, create money, create revenue to pay for the lining so they don't lose the water. Um, in other cases, we're actually putting solar, dragging solar, so canal floating solar between our turbines, um, cooling the panels, preventing evaporation. Uh, so there's a bunch of opportunities that we can take advantage of uh, there. Um, in, the, in the second half of your question, did I answer that? Uh, no, uh, future trends uh, that might affect the water. Oh, that's right, that's right. So this is a very, obviously our investors and our projects and the banks that we're working with, this is a, a very significant um, um, issue that we have to talk about. In some cases with climate change, it actually, the trends are that it's making the models better. Um, but when we look at a typical project, we look at a 30-year 30 um, 30 history. So most of these districts actually, even if it's handwritten, they actually have a pretty good history. Um, and so we can use that history to predict what the performance will be in the future, recognizing that there will be drought years, there will be high water years, um, that all the part of the economic performance, it all has to work. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, Wen Ning Zhang, uh, SLB New Energy. So Yi and uh, you all talking about the speed and the scope and... Uh, talking about so many technologies, and uh, from a TRL level, I can see from all different level, right? I mean, and uh, James probably, you probably maybe, TRL level is pretty high, I would say probably eight, nine, or seven. And the yeast uh, and the value probably maybe six or seven, right? I saw some demonstration. I just want uh, understanding from, uh, Chris and also uh, James, uh, what is your TRL level? And see, I see a lot of cartoons. I have not seen the prototype, and just maybe for our audience to understand what is the level and how far, how quick can bring to the market. Thank you. 
items you want to? Well, I can go. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, right now we're TR level six. I, I do think I did show a slide that showed a uh, prototype in operation um, right now, but it's not at a commercial scale yet. And for us at the industrial scale, about a megawatt and 10 megawatt hour storage is about the minimum capacity that's industrially relevant. And so um, that's what we're working towards. Yeah. Great. Yeah, um, I didn't include a slide on the, with, with photos. Sorry about that. So um, if you search for our name, though, there's some uh, news articles from a couple months ago that have some lab prototype photos. So <laughs> check it out. But um, yeah, we're on the earlier TRL side compared to what, was just, what you just mentioned. Uh, but we are working on uh, towards the first demo system uh, for real-world real field testing uh, next year. Yeah. Where will that be? Uh, we got started in California, n nearby. Yeah. yeah. Good. Great. Questions? Naomi, can I ask a question here? Yeah, please do. I want to ask uh, <laughs> Chris a question. So that's uh, the the battery, the carbon CO two. It looks like you also use temperature. Do you use high temperature? When I look at your presentation, I think your presentation may be the similarity in terms of oh, mechanism. Right. Um, yeah, we're we're not that hot, but uh, but there's a there, there's a hot zone exactly. Yeah, as yeah. you as you might know, uh, yeah. salt oxide fuel cell related technology. Yeah, the uh, energy conversion is um, is in that is in that hot zone, um, okay. which is both uh, you know it's like you pay with it's annoying. There's heat management, but it's also what enables it to be you know high router efficiency and and work as as described basically, right? So. 600C, 800C, maybe you cannot tell <laughs> us. <laughs> Inquiring <laughs> minds want to know. <laughs> you know as a scientist, just keep thinking, well, I think got to be high temperature. I was thinking about temperature range, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a parasitic too. load, no, for sure. It, it, doesn't no, need, I, uh, it doesn't need heat input, though. It, it's self-sustaining, right? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, I, so, so, you know, earlier today, maybe we can kind of use the last couple of minutes to, to tie this together. We were talking about um, the different requirements for storage and specifically, you know, around the world, right? Different geographic locations. I would love to get your thoughts, your ahas listening to that on how you imagine, you know, your particular technologies that you've been discussing today fit into that kind of geographic distribution of how we're going to have different storage um, around the world in various different regions. Eric, so, uh, yeah, well, I'll start Change because your map I with water. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I will. I'll start because I have the, the the incremental impact, but on a very broad scale. Um, I mean, I guess it's not necessarily an aha moment, but it, what we're trying to do, and the impact that it has on storage, is by giving. Um, uh, making tools inherent to the operation of an existing system so that it has a positive impact on the, um, the time use of energy. Um, so just the built-in economics of the system today help levelize that, particularly, you know, here in California, excuse me, California, places that have time of use um, um, uh, expenses associated or rates associated with, with uh, power. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say that there, I, I would say there's two cases. Um, one is where you have operations in remote areas where you don't necessarily have a grid and um, thinking about remote mining in Australia where they have a lot of renewable assets and um, need storage to um, be able to scale. Mm -hmm. um, and in Australia, for various reasons, there's, um, growth in the mining sector. Um, so then I would say also in regions that have very high natural gas or have to bring in LNG, um, storage will play an important role in thinking about Asia and uh, parts of Europe. Um, then South America where there's like Chile, um, also remote mining regions that um, storage is important asset to the renewables that they deploy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this morning I was teaching, so I didn't know what's discussed in geolo uh, geographic dependence. I will guess there will be different temperature conditions 
at different places of the world. From our customer, for example, for nickel hydrogen, why they like it? As soon as they talk to us, they say, this is what we get out of lithium ion because our soil is so hot right there. And then your, your battery life for the lithium ion will reduce tremendously. Then you need to turn on the air conditioning so, so much. Then your energy efficiency just go down so much. They look at this very wide temperature range of performance, high temperature, low temperature, maintenance free. That's exactly what you need for the, uh, you know, where you can generate energy, that's one. And the second thing is the safety is so, so important. A, a company, you know, high up in the executive level, a local government official, they could lose their job easily because of safety incidents. So remember that safety is absolutely got to come up, come up as a, one of the top field considerations you need to make. So you want to have accident free of storage. So that has been uh, attracting uh, customers a lot. Just uh, within the, uh, the nation, so in the venue already have uh, purchase order, pre-order, adding together seven to eight gigawatt hour already. So that's a huge purchase order right there. So we see this from customer feedback, they really understand what's on the field they need. And I think all the technology eventually want to share with the audience, right? As a professor, I like to publish science and nature paper. And it's that top performance gave you a science and nature. Once you really talk about the real world problem, and then there's seven, eight, ten things you need to consider all at the same time. And then what's the technology really winning out? You got to do it on the field. Then you truly understand what does it take? I think that feedback will be very important. Coming back to that question is a scale speed. You want to go to the scale, your technology got to work first, right? So you want to have speed, and when the technology works, the cost is attractive, and then people will be willing to put in an investment to scale with speed. Yeah. It seems to me that, I, 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 my boy was sick this morning, so I had to miss the, miss the uh, morning session. None of the Stanford session. folk were here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it, it strikes me that the, the storage story is going to be like the renewable story and that there's gonna, it's going to be very, very regional. So, you know, Chris had a cumulative um, state of charge and discharge curve. Those are going to be wildly different in different parts of the world, right? And, and actually, they'd be even more different than you'd think because you go from, like, San Diego to London, for example, not only does your solar resource degrade, but then you get this cumulative compounding effect of, like, it's also cold at the same, right? So you, you, get, you get this double effect of, like, when your solar resource is bad, your heat demand is high, and your sort of your cumulative um, demand um, over the course of the year, your sort of cumulative sizing duration curve, you know, really can change a lot. And so I'd say it's, it's, it's super premature to say, although you can do back of the envelope kind of stuff, but I think it's, it's probably really pre premature to say one region will need this and one region will, will need that. I think the reality is different regions are going to need different mixes of different technologies yeah. just because, you know, the, if you're in Costa Rica, like, well, well okay, it's, you know. Yeah. Humidity changes a little bit, weather changes a little bit, but you're you know four degrees off the equator. You, the seasonality that we see in the northern hemisphere doesn't exist, right? Or if you're in Singapore or Hawaii or something like that, it's very even over the course of the year. Other places not so much, right? And so I, I think it's um, yeah, I, w I would say it's it doesn't need to be the same answer everywhere. Even it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just each region will have to kind of deal with it, right? Yeah. I can just say from our perspective. Um, we're pretty excited about um, trying to enable uh, some locations that don't have a strong fossil grid already, right? So they can sort of, uh, you know, you've probably heard about that, they bypass the landlines and go right to cell phones kind of thing. So, um, but it's kind of a balancing act. We have to weigh the logistical headaches of trying to do that soon. Um, and then also the IRA is here, right? Yeah. And that's actually really impactful for the big changes that just happened there. So. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think having listened to the conversation throughout the day, one of the things um, that uh, I wanted to mention to sort of close this out, and while we have Anna from the DOE in the room, um, is that, you know, for hydrogen and carbon management, we have this 
um, national support, right, to do demonstration projects to really kind of um, accelerate trying these technologies, right? So, you know, I, I like this idea of being able to um, try things with low risk, right? We need to sort of successfully fail, right, um, in order to find the right solutions. And so it strikes me that, you know, we've got so many um, different technologies that are going to solve different parts of the value chain. And to the um, uninformed observer, I think it's not clear that these aren't in competition with each other, that each one has kind of got these niche, uh, this role to play, right, across the um, uh, spectrum in terms of um, uh, power uh, and um, uh, storage duration. And so, you know, I think this sort of community needs to come together more often to really sort of emphasize that we're all working towards the same goal uh, to provide reliability and to figure out how we put a value on that so that we can get more incentives in place and more opportunities to actually uh, demonstrate these technologies in, in the real world. So I, uh, with that, I thank you all for your contributions and um, please join me in thanking our panelists.